Hello, everyone. Welcome to the We Shape podcast. I'm Katie. I'm here with the co-hosts that are our wonderful co-hosts, <laughs> Nina Hi. and Tyler. Hi. Um, I'm going to call out Nina sweatshirt right away. This was my birthday gift to her last week. It says, anxiety is my cardio. True story. <laughs> I'm obsessed with that sweatshirt. Thank you for wearing it. <laughs> Thank you for bringing it to the pub- for the public to see. Um, I'm really excited. I'm going to jump right in today. We have a guest. Um, I had the privilege of being on this person's podcast, and we had a really phenomenal discussion, and she actually opened my eyes to so many things I had never considered. Um, and so I'm really excited just to kind of jump right in and have a really meaningful discussion with her. Um, her name is Wendy Francis. I'm actually going to pass over the computer because uh, Nina does such a phenomenal job with the introductions and uh, the bio. So we'll, we'll start there, and then we'll, we'll bring Wendy in. All right. Wendy's got a good bio, so I'll have to get a deep breath here. Ooh, here we go. <clears throat> Wendy Francis, MSRD CPC, is a pioneer in her field, forging the way for others to find freedom from their food. For the last three decades, the fundamentals of her work have moved clients into uncovering, overcoming, and changing their relationship with their food, their body, their weight, and themselves. Whether she is working with a college student or a group of executive women, Wendy's focus lies in turning fears into freedom. Her multifaceted strategies move clients from reaction to action by focusing on the why they do things as well as the how. Wendy is a registered dietitian with a graduate degree in counseling and nutrition education. She has extensive expertise in training eating disorders and trauma and is certified in life coaching, strategic business coaching, neurolinguistics, somatic experiencing, and grief coaching. Wendy has worked in her own private practice for the past 30 years working with hundreds of clients and has owned four multifaceted successful businesses. She's a recognized speaker, best-selling author, podcast personality, and facilitative entrepreneur. Wendy's love and passion focus on the whole individual, providing her varied experience and training to impart tremendous benefit to both professionals and patients using multiple modalities to create lasting change in thoughts, language, physiology, and behaviors. Personally, Wendy loves finding time for yoga, self-growth, community, and friendship connections and spending time with her three amazing children welcome wendy welcome. hey that's quite a bio yeah, thanks <laughs> that was great nina <laughs> i always forget like you know you do these things and then they add up after 30 years and you're like whoa wow i really I forgot i did that <laughs> <laughs> i mean that i think that i mean yeah i don't even honestly know where to start i was we were chatting beforehand around like where we wanted to take this discussion because i know you have so much experience in the eating disorder world. And one of the things that my eyes have been open to as we talk about the connection with food and our wellness um, is sort of, and and you kind of said it in your bio, you know, We Shape has like a mission statement. And the mission statement is we're changing how and why people exercise, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to avoid the topic of food so many times because Mm -hmm. one, I just don't believe in diets anymore. I don't believe that there's a one size fits all approach. And I feel like it's just extremely complicated and layered and emotionally loaded. Mm -hmm. Um, But the reality is, is if I'm in the fitness space, the food part just kind of comes with it. So I figure rather than avoiding it, it's best that we have conversations about it. And you and you kind of talked about that connection of how and why we're doing things. So I wonder if we should we should maybe start there. Um, Because I think that one of the things we don't realize is that disordered eating is on a spectrum. And correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, And I feel like there are a lot of food behaviors that we normalize in our society that fall on that spectrum that we do not recognize as disordered eating and that actually get praise and validation. Oh, you're so, you're so disciplined and look at how your body looks. You're so healthy. And, um, I, I feel like there's a lot of problems associated with that. And I think that our community here at We Shape and our podcast listeners can greatly benefit from that discovery and from really peeling back some of those layers around the spectrum and around some of these normalized behaviors around food. So, I don't know where you want to start with that. Buckle up and be kind to yourselves, (laughs) listeners. This one might be interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, that's the first thing, right? We're we're not really taught to be kind to ourselves, one. Mm -hmm. And we're not really taught to connect to ourselves, two. What is right for us, right? How do we want to eat? What feels good in our body? You know, we can go all the way back to that. Um, But the truth is, yeah, there is a... a range, right? People hear I'm an eating disorder specialist and they're like, well, I don't have anorexia. And I'm like, I get it. Uh, I don't know why I was sent to you. I don't have bulimia. I don't throw up. I get it. 
But let's just talk about like how you eat, how you feel when you eat. Do you ever not eat when you're hungry? Do you order the salad when you want the burger? And, you know, or do you order the side salad and your stomach's growling because you're afraid to take that next step or you don't, you don't like how it looks to other people or you're afraid of what the scale's going to say tomorrow morning. We've normalized scales and how mm-hmm. they have become, I don't want to say a God because I don't want it that I don't mean that in a religious construct, but like we take that as so much validation as to what that thing says. Many of us. It's a measuring um, post and, for self-worth, right? Right. I mean, it, it really becomes like the policeman and absolutely the Richter scale for are we good enough today? Mm. Mm, God. Oh. And Ouch. we are we are we are right, and we are good enough regardless of what the number on that scale says. And unfortunately, we have normalized weighing ourselves. We have normalized being in a double zero, which I don't know why any adult woman in a double zero functions. Like I, unless there, listen, there are, there's a genetic thing, right? For some people, I'm totally not going to discount that by any means. But for a lot of people who are in their 30s or 40s, being a double zero just doesn't equate to me. Maybe if you're nine and you're prepubescent, right? Um, but we, we've normalized weighing ourselves. We've normalized eating salads or fruit when we're hungry. At, at, or right here is the biggest thing, and I didn't do this on purpose, but like you're hungry, oh, drink a lot of water. And I'm like, but that... <laughs> But maybe you're really hungry. Yeah. <laughs> like this, there's no, there's no nutrition in this. It's yeah. good for you. Don't get me wrong. I drink my water, right? But we, we've normalized all of that. And there is a term called orthorexia, which we now have diagnostically, which has helped me tremendously because for many years, young girls were sent to me and they didn't have a diagnosis of anorexia because they didn't meet the weight criteria. Mm-hmm. They didn't have a diagnosis of bulimia because they didn't purge. And they didn't have a diagnosis of compulsive overeating because they hadn't gained so much weight. But they clearly had something wrong because all they did was think about food all the time, what they were going to eat, when they were going to eat, how they were going to eat it, what the scale said, how they were going to lose that, what size they were in their genes. And now we have a term for that, and that's called orthorexia. And that's probably and the so most praised that- thing, right? Is like, you know, people who are in this in this category are getting praised constantly. Because they're so focused on doing the best thing for their body, but it's it's not just necessarily driven by a desire to show up for themselves and connect with themselves, right? It's it, it's they're very disciplined. You're so mm-hmm. disciplined. I don't know how you have so much discipline. How do you how do you do it? Right? We give them this esteem, and and if the truth is, if that's the only place that that person is getting a sense of identity. Well, then it's really hard to let go of, right? If mm-hmm. if they're the one that's always disciplined, right? Then how do you let that go? And what we're doing then is we're fostering the exact word that you said. We're fostering disconnection from oneself. Whenever you are disconnected or out of alignment with yourself, right? You are in reaction to something else and you're outside of you. And we've normalized that when it comes to food. Oh, you're hungry, just drink water. Oh, you're hungry, just eat an apple. (laughs) Well, we've not only normalized it, we've praised it. Like you said, like, oh my gosh, look at how in shape you are. Look at how, oh, the scale says this. It's like, I can relate to the experience in the past of feeling like if I checked all the boxes, I would live forever. My health would be aligned. Mm -hmm. I would be, I would be excused from, you know, disease or and it just is it's an obsessive way of thinking about things and i and i when i started sort of deconstructing these beliefs and i think you really hit the nail on the head which is the detachment from the identity mm-hmm. when i started doing that it was like oh shit my mind has more capacity to do other things that bring me joy and connection and and it was like such a weird like almost for a little while like void in my mind like i feel like i should be doing something that i'm not doing anymore But it was once I could get past that and just accept the idea that like, if I'm going to make a conscious effort to grow in in this life, Mm. most of that will require me shifting identities over and over and over again. And so the 
ability to not become so deeply enmeshed in the attachment of the identity Mm -hmm. for me has been the way that I can move through that. It's like anytime I'm triggered or like resistant to something, it's, I use the example of Alex Light has a book. I'm sure you've heard of this. You are not a before photo. Mm -hmm. It's a phenomenal book. And in that book, she makes a suggestion for many books. And one of them was food is not medicine. And if you would have told me two, two, three, two years ago, you should get this book. I would have been so triggered and so defensive because I was attached to the identity that the food that I ate and the things that I did for my health, not to say it's, this is where it's tricky, right? Because it's like, you know, eating certain foods sometimes do make me feel better, do give me more energy, but the obsessive nature and the intention of how and why I was doing it was causing me so much stress and disconnection with self. And the fact that I would have been triggered by that book suggestion tells me that I'm too attached to that identity. And so I feel like I can at least, I haven't read the book yet, but I did buy it. (laughs) (laughs) That I have at least come somewhere because I'm able to acknowledge that that also might be true. Mm. But it's hard to break up with those identities, right? We establish our connections with other people, with our careers, with our families based on those identities. And if we say we're not identifying as that person anymore, how do I connect with other? How do I get my validation? How do I get my, the praise that I, that feels so good? Who am I is a scary place to be. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, and it's so like, I forget years ago, years and years ago, I can't remember how many now, but I remember listening to one of the first, I don't know if you guys remember this, but Oprah and Deepak Chopra did like their meditation series. Do you remember how they used to have that out? This is going years back. And on one of the first one, I was, I was obsessed. As soon as that, the first one I heard was the first time I ever meditated. It was like a, a huge light bulb for some reason, the way that their voices went, et cetera. In any case, I remember clearly on one of the first audios that I heard, what it, he says, um, ask yourself, who am I? Who am I without your name? Who am I without your identity? And I was like, whoa, we're so not taught that. Mm. We're so taught to be the eating disorder professional, the person that has discipline, the person that, you know, the, the, the one that's skinny in the group, right? The one that exercises all the time. Oh, she goes to the gym all the time. She's amazing. I don't know how she does that. And I go, Steven in her body. Like mm. you know, she even there, right? So, but we're we're not taught that our identity just is who we are in here. That it's mm-hmm. not what we do. Mm. We have it backwards. We think that our identity is what we do. We don't eat certain foods, or we only eat certain foods. We exercise a certain way. We're a cyclist or a runner, right? That's our identity. And to give that up, well, first of all, it's why adolescents are fraught with these issues, so to speak, because they're trying so hard to grasp outside themselves for an identity. Mm. I mean, if we just taught our kids that they they were who they were from the inside, and that's a whole other topic for <laughs> another day. But yeah. Um, but you know, adolescents are grasping. And then the truth is that then stays with us as we get older, right? Because then you have that identity. You move from being the, you know, the girl or the the guy in high school who who never ate anything with fat in it or whatever it is, right? To the college student, to the person in the career, right? Oh, she's such a healthy eater, Mm -hmm. right? To to passing that on. To the next yeah, generation. It, it go, it, and it yeah. goes up with you. And then there's a whole other topic of discussion. And Carolyn Costin talks about it in Your Dieting Daughter. Um, Carolyn Costin is amazing. And um, and then, right, and then when we become mothers or fathers, well, oof, we take those beliefs and that identity and we pop that right into our kids. Not that we mean to. Yeah. But it just happens. Right. Or, or gosh, your mom your mom is such a healthy eater. She's amazing. And then the child hears that and goes, Ooh, if I'm good, then I eat like mommy. Mm. And if I'm bad, then I don't. 
right? So that 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 gets really mucky, and I know that, but just so you can kind of see how that cycle then continues. I think one of the really interesting things about that as well that comes up for me is that when we are searching for identity in our teen years and into our adult lives, really, we oftentimes feel really afraid to let the identity shift. Like you pick one and you're like, okay, I picked this box. And then you're like, well, if I change the box, people are going to think I'm like fake or I'm a poser Mm -hmm. or I'm like a mercurial personality. I can't be trusted. Like people are not supposed to be like just this static thing. Like you're allowed to change. And like, I've been a vegetarian. I've been a vegan. I've also eaten meat. Like it's okay to try things that work for your body and see what works for your body. And I think like we're really in fear of like you were in this box and then you moved and now I am distrustful of you or um, you don't fit the narrative of what I want you to be. Well, I think it's because I was talking with someone about this the other day. It's because there's this idea that if you change, you're afraid of the reaction from other people because the way there's things about that identity that give you validation. So then if Mm -hmm. you change... And then the people around you are uh, triggered in your change because if you're changing, should I be changing? And then Mm -hmm. they project judgment on you, which then you're like, when I was this way, I was getting things projected at me that felt good. And when I change, I'm getting things projected at me that don't feel good. Right. But that's actually not rooted in your stuff. That's rooted in their stuff because you're making them scared to change. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) But I mean, but that's how you also know who your people are. Yes. Because Mm -hmm. I... Nina and I have been friends for 15 years and we are not the same people ever. Like, (laughs) like, like we, we've had goth phases. We've had, we've had like, I mean, so goth on the inside. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, We need another hour for the podcast. We're going to remember all the phases. We've had dieting phases. We've had health phases. We've had, I mean, the number of identities that you and I have transformed through, Yeah. but at the core, we have a connection in a way that allows us to say, doesn't really matter that you're safe, right? I think yeah. like when you change the box you're in, sometimes if those are more like peripheral friendships or people who don't support you at a deeper level, mm-hmm. then they're like, oh, well, you don't fit my narrative. So you're not my friend anymore. And you lose connection. And I yeah. think we we are so struggling to find connection with self that we see connection with other. And then when someone's like, oh, well, we were both really close friends because we shared this diet principle or this uh, taste in music and you shift that, then they're like, ooh, you're going to be ostracized because like I can't relate to you. And it's there's fear there. Yeah. And I think we should. I think one, we should normalize that relationships evolve and change and that the determination of the quality of a relationship is not the number of years a relationship exists. That's a whole episode of a podcast. (laughs) And then also, um, sometimes people are brought into our life that have a really what I like to call deep, authentic soul connection that is meant to go with you through all of those things and hold on to those people dearly, right? Both can exist. Yeah. So it, I don't know. It's it's complicated, but I think we're on the same page with this sort of like, uh, uh, it was hard for me to break free from the identity of I'm the healthy person. What if what if somebody sees me in the store buying a donut now? I used I, to be so jealous too. I'd be like, oh my God, Katie's so disciplined. <laughs> that was, the same I idea. was deeply There's suffering. The <laughs> right. There's the word disciplined, right? Yeah. We use that a lot for people that control their food. And And so like, I would love to talk, Wendy, like, I don't know, just off the top of your head, like, what are just a couple things that you think our culture normalizes as it pertains to our relationship with food Mm -hmm. that maybe I want to encourage our listeners to just pause and say, because here's the thing. When I was connecting with food in that way, I didn't know I was actually suffering. Mm -hmm. I thought everything was great. It yes. wasn't until I decided that I was going to evaluate that relationship with my with my food and with the number that I saw on the scale and until I said, wait a minute, even though I think I'm oh, happy in this, let me just pause and see if I'm actually okay. And then, of course, the answer was, oh, hell no, you're not. But like, what is that? Maybe you could talk just a, a, about a couple things like so that if people hear this, they're like, oh, wait, I weigh myself every day or oh, wait, like I only buy organic or like, can you help me just just so that people can crack the door. That's what I talk about a lot here is like, just crack the door to curiosity. Yeah. I think, you know, you, you brought up one really valid point and I'm constantly talking to, especially women about this. I think men have a different perception, not all. So I don't want to stereotype, but the scale. I mean, if, if you're weighing yourself every day or multiple times a day, that scale, and if it's a determinant of your mood, your scale impacts how you feel about yourself and your mood there's an interesting connection because no external thing should be able to do that for you. Yeah. 
right? No, no external thing like a scale should be able to do that for you. So that's one component. If you get up every morning or before you go to bed every night or multiple times in between. when you're And that is a normalized behavior, right? Because in the is. past, if I came to you and said, oh man, I weighed myself and I gained three pounds, you'd be like, oh yeah, that sucks. I know that feel like, feels like. So that right there is mm-hmm. not a healthy dialogue. I think uh, 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 not normalizing that would look like, really, Katie, you're defining your day and your worth by that number? Like, right. but again- our culture normalizes that. So when I go to my best friend and say, shit, I might, I gained three pounds over the weekend. You, we, we used to go, okay, well, we just won't, we'll skip our, we'll skip our cheat day this week. Yeah. I think underneath this though, is this belief system that says we're not worthy unless we, whatever. Right. I see your book over here that Katie's holding shattering the belief code and I have not read it, but I, I feel like I, I maybe, have a direction of where that might might go. And I think that if we believe that we need to achieve, that we need to do something, that we need to be a certain way in order to feel loved and valued, then we're always chasing and yeah. we're never whole. And it's not until we pause and say to ourselves, I'm already whole. Yeah. I'm I'm deserving of love, regardless of what I do in this world. Yeah. Always going to be scrambling and chasing for it. It's true. If we start from the premise okay. of we're full, so to speak, yeah. as opposed to we're empty. Right. Because if we're empty, we've got to fill up with mm. the number on the scale, with grades, with money, with the next business, with whatever. Right. If we're if we're empty, we've got to fill up with that stuff. The problem is this stuff goes away. You mm. gotta weigh yourself the next day. Yeah. There's, it's always scrambling for more. You gotta make more for the next money day. tomorrow. Right. Mm-hmm. Like take it in so many different directions, right? We've got to, we've got to eat less tomorrow. Whatever that is, right? So we come from the premise of yeah, we're 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 full, we're we're whole in who we are, and each of us is really cool <laughs> because we're all different, and that's really our identity. Really, our identity is like who we are inside. So, not like connecting with that difference that makes you you, not right. connecting with the projected image that you think you should be. Exactly. Whenever it's a should, you always got to throw it out. I mean, because that's always about somebody or something. Else. Oh my God. That's like a, write that one down, tattoo that somewhere. Getting a new right? sweatshirt with that. <laughs> if it's an, I should right. pause and examine that and figure right. out what's going on there. Yeah. And the truth is, you know, when it comes to food, right, we are taught to normalize that word so much when it comes to food. I should eat, right. I should eat my vegetables. Right. Who, who said like, what if vegetables make you feel terrible? What if you have gas all day long? Like, we need to talk. Like, yeah. they're not right for you, or maybe you have to pick different ones. Yeah. Right? Or, or I shouldn't eat dessert. Well, who said and why? Like, who is that that's telling you that? Mm-hmm. Shouldn't, shouldn't in food shouldn't exist. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's food. funny. This is not just in nutrition. Like this is in the entire health and wellness industry. Um, oh, yeah. We host live calls and I had this wonderful lady on a live call and she had come on a few weeks back and she had said she hurt herself and she was going on a trip and she was asking for advice. And she's clearly in this like no pain, no gain mentality. And I was like, be kind to yourself. You don't have to do workouts, like treat yourself kindly, like listen to your body. And then she came back and she was like, I'm really happy. I took your advice. Everything was way better. Like I felt really good. And then she's like, I'm doing your workouts, but I want to do them more. And I said, why? Right. And it's because you believe that more is better. You you're stuck in that no pain, no gain. And then she said, my son's a trainer at a, a, a fitness program. I won't say the name, but it rhymes with Schmorn Schmiri, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I okay. And their whole thing is oh, predicated on, give me a second. on heart rate. Right. And, and that's the whole thing we say at we shape is like, we're not about pumping your muscles and elevating your heart rate so you can change the way you look. We're about mm-hmm. connecting with your body, helping you really, you know, feel into it so that you, so yeah. that you learn how to move your body in a way that feels good so that you really connect with your body. And right. she just had this moment where she, I could just see her eyes just going like, oh my God, I was doing all these things because I thought that it's more is better. No pain, right. no gain. I'm supposed to do all these things. I'm like, how is that working out for you? You're like 60. How's that working out for you right now? And it's just not. I mean, the whole industry is really backwards in that. It's always seeking something outside of ourselves rather than listening to ourselves and honoring that. And I think too, like we are kind of designed or we're trained to say like, if it's not perfect, it doesn't count. 
Ooh, like, that's a brutal you know, one. Like, I'll have yeah, I know you and I suffer from that one. Yeah, yeah. I'll have a, a something, you know, like maybe I have a pastry for breakfast and then I have a salad for lunch. And I'm like, well, the salad, like all the nutrition in the salad is totally a wash. Like, that's not necessarily true, you know? Or like if I do a walk outside with my friends, like, well, that's not a workout because I didn't break a sweat. Or, you know, mm. we just, if it's not perfect, it doesn't even go on to the count. Like, you don't even get to have points for that. And that's just so not true. Mm -hmm. There's balance. We need balance. It's true. I mean, your body doesn't not absorb the nutrition from the vegetables because you ate the pastry in the morning. Right. Like our, it feels like that. Right. Right. Like our body functions. Like I just did a post this week and I, I got so many people that reached out to me, like old clients. They're like, I remember you saying that. I'm like, well, could you listen? I mean, we forget <laughs> that like our body actually works. Like, like there's calories that go for pumping our heart. There's calories that make 440 calories a day go just to pump your heart. Wow. Just to pump your heart. 24 seven, it pumps. Nobody says, thank you. <laughs> nobody says, <laughs> nobody says uh, I'm going to eat the half a burger to pump my heart, right? Everybody's like, no, calorie in, calorie out. You got to have this balance or you got to go underneath 3,500 calories. I'm like, guys, like we have a body. Like we have a heart, we have lungs, we have organs, right? We have, we have digestion, absorption, digestion, absorption, take up 10% of your caloric intake. 10%. I did not know be that. Like say thank you and treat it nice. <laughs> right. Because it does so many things for us. And we're constantly, especially, you know, in the dieting industry and in the fitness industry, we're constantly teaching this whole thing, right. About, um, you know, if you eat, you need to eat 1500 calories because that's what we figured out on this calculation. And then you got to under consume 500 calories a day so that you can meet your 3,500 calorie de deficit so that you could lose pounds. And I'm like, oh yeah, you unzip them and you really assess their heart and how much it needs. And then you really looked at the kidney. No, you didn't do any of that. How do you really know? And so we're just corroborating with the disconnection from our body and the disconnection from ourself. And the more we do that, the more we kind of keep that bridge between who we are inside, physically, physiologically, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, the more we're gonna see not good things happen to how we are on the spectrum, right? And, and how we treat our food, how we treat our body and how we treat other people because we're and just so disconnected. The, the, the wellness space, the fitness and diet space have so much to gain from that construct of, yeah, unless you look this way, you aren't valuable. And yeah. so now buy this. Okay, that didn't work great. So now buy that. Okay, that didn't work great. So now buy this. Mm -hmm. There is significantly less for people to gain mm -hmm. um, from a business perspective if you feel great about yourself. And so I think acknowledging that... Mm -hmm. um, Tyler and I used to own a fitness company that was all about get a six pack, do the keto diet, do this, do that. And we got lots of customers because people feel like shit about themselves all the time yeah. until one day I said, I'm not available. I cannot sell these things anymore because it's all predicated on me making a profit on someone's insecurity. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when people come into eShape and they're like, I'm here for weight loss. I'm like, well, you're, you're if you're going to stay with us, you're going to go down a different path. Um, I allow them to tell us in the quiz that they want weight loss. Fine. You can tell me that, but it doesn't mean I'm going to give you that. Right, um, right. I'm going yeah, you to have this beautiful drawing of, you know, the old iceberg. We're like 25% is above water and 75% is below. Mm -hmm. And then in our iceberg, it's like you coming in for your workouts on the top. And then it's like, now we're going to give you a community to support deconstructing your beliefs so that you can find a new intention underneath it. And that's the 75% that really, really matters for that long-term I mean, sustainability. I joke that people come in and they say, I should work out. And my hope is that by the, the time they're here for a little while, mm -hmm. uh, their, their narrative has shifted to, I connect with self. And that's where I make decisions from. Yeah. I don't make decisions from I, I should work out anymore. Like, I don't care if people work out every day. I don't care if people work out every week. I'm like, join our community and debunk some of the myths that you understand about the industry. Understand that the industry is not here to serve your best interest. If we zoomed out and said, okay, we're going to create a product or something that a consumer can purchase that mm -hmm. genuinely, scientifically has their best emotional, spiritual, psychological, and physical well-being in mind, about 99% of the products in the market would, would not meet that criteria. True. And yeah. so I think people need to realize that. 
people mm-hmm. sometimes I had to believe it or not in our old company, I had wonderful intentions because I was under the belief system that this diet and this exercise made people healthier. And when people are healthier in their body, their lives were better. Mm-hmm. It just, the approach was way off, but the intention was good. So I'm not saying that some companies don't have good intentions. I'm just saying that I don't know that most companies have really like gone down the rabbit hole of, is this really good? Is this really helping people at the core, at the, at the real deep level that we need to be helping people at? And I think most of them haven't, unfortunately. And so if you're looking for something, it doesn't even have to be we shape, but if you're looking for something that has your best interest in mind, you need to evaluate those things. Mm-hmm. You need to say, why am I buying this? And if I buy this, will this actually support me emotionally, psychologically, socially, spiritually? Is this the intention or am I going to be sucked into this product, giving me badges and points and and competitive, you know, like I'm, I'm going to compete? Like, what is that actually doing? And I think sometimes, like we've talked about so much, we've normalized the the identity and the reward and the praise and the validation mechanisms that we never pause to just say, does this actually serve my well-being? Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to have people do that other than I just keep saying, crack the door to curiosity, crack the door to curiosity, crack mm-hmm. the door to curiosity. Because like I said, I was deep in my identity around you're healthy, you're diligent, you're disciplined, life is good. And it wasn't until I cracked the door. Um, and let me tell you, crack the door did not mean I bought that book, Food is Not Medicine. That came two years later. Right. Crack the door meant I'm going to kind of just think about maybe like really think about does do I feel really fulfilled do I feel and and those are hard questions Mm -hmm. but I think I think they're worth asking I I would I would have a follow-up question to this that's kind of related to this whole conversation which may be a nice way to kind of wrap this thing or kind of move this thing towards the end here which is like the theme we're having is disconnection from self and the desire for external validation breeds so many um uh, I don't want to use the word issues, but it just, it just basically, it, it makes us make a lot of decisions from that place. Right. Mm-hmm. And we ignore ourselves and we ignore ourselves and we ignore ourselves and we get the praise and we ignore ourselves more towards that. And at least in my experience, I watch the people who get to where society thinks we want to be. Mm-hmm. And those are the people that have the opportunity to go, Oh, wait, nothing is ever going to fill this void. Mm-hmm. I need to go back inside and really find a way to fill that void. But for the people who haven't gotten there, who mm-hmm. quote unquote, don't have the discipline, you know, whatever society's telling them, they still have this optimism that if they do get there, it'll make them feel happy. And mm-hmm. I, all they can say on the podcast over and over again is this is not going to work. I promise you, you know, mm-hmm. but how do you, how do you help everyone return back to themselves? Even if they've never had the experience of uh, achieving what society tells us we want to achieve and recognizing that they're still empty inside. Mm. We keep having conversations like this because I think that it, I think that the more that people start talking about this, we're starting a a company here called conscious Nona where I live because it's about the awakening and the connection within self. Right. Um, And I think the more that we create conscious companies and the more that we have conscious conversations about connection, about community, and that it comes from within, um, and the more that the people, the other, the other, one, I think that's what moves things in the right direction. I also think the more that the people that reach that pinnacle, the more that people talk about Matthew McConaughey talks about this. Um, I, I love him. I don't just love the way he looks, I do. <laughs> but we'll go, but we'll go a step further. <laughs> um, you know, he got to a place in his career and he was tired of doing the rom-cons. Like he was tired of it. The romantic comedies. He's like, I'm not doing them anymore. And he got, I mean, this is a guy that's making millions. And what he did is he got a trailer in the desert for six months and he went and sat there to figure out who he was in here and what he wanted. And I heard that story, but I don't know how many people have. So what I'm saying is the people that reach that pinnacle, that if they could come back and start speaking it, people might listen to that mm, as well, word. right? Because because you, you have to hit people where they are, so to speak. And if we're so used to looking up to people, right? Certain people, whoever that is, whether it's actors, actresses, politicians, if those people get to those places, please would they come back and share that with 
us because then I think it then it becomes more normalized. And what yeah. we're all so afraid of here, here's all of our deepest core core fear is that we are not lovable. Mm, we're not enough. That we're not enough. That is our deepest fear. So if we want to take time off or we want to not work out for a month when we've been working out our entire life, or we want to stop the dieting cycle that we've been in for 25 years, that if people start to speak that they've done that and they've lived through it (laughs) and they've learned things about themselves, then other people can start to feel like, oh, I can do that too. Look, she's still enough and people still like her. And so then I could be that too. I think that's where we have to go, that the people that are aware that that get this whole point, the more that we start keep talking about it, like you guys are doing a great thing with We Shape because um, just like the dieting industry has been so toxic, the fitness industry and, and has come right along. And I don't mm-hmm. think that the fitness industry started necessarily in this direction, but it went there really fast. Mm-hmm. Um, just like, you know, the dieting industry. I don't think it, I do believe that food can be thy medicine if you if you connect with the food in that way, right? If if you have diabetes, like please take care, touch, tap into what makes your blood sugar go up and down, right? Like that is your medicine, right? But we use it in such a way that it's toxic. Mm-hmm. That we develop a toxic relationship around what that healing actually is, right? Um I hear you saying what's the underlying intention, right? Yeah. Are you yeah. showing up out of a place of self-love and self-care? You know, right. like the the analogy I like to tell our people is you wake up and you brush your teeth because you want to care for your teeth, right? right. And and that's just a habit that we've all accepted. Right. But then you go to do your workout because you hate yourself. <laughs> and it's like your body is your teeth and the rest of your muscles, everything is all the same. Like just show up to care for your body because you want to feel good because you appreciate yourself. Yeah. And what's really yeah. happening is I show up out of self-judgment. I show yeah. up out of self-hatred. I show up out of unworthiness. And, I show up uh, out of should or shame. Yeah, shape. should. Yeah. And that's should just- Should um, or shame or guilt. I appreciate your perspective. I can see you feel it. I really can yeah. see you feel this. No, I'm, I'm super passionate about this because I've lived it. I mean, I've lived it myself. I've lived it through all of my clients that have been in recovery. And I've watched them like get to a place where they're like, but if I don't exercise, like I'm going to explode. And I'm like, I, I swear, I promise you can call me 15 times tomorrow. Whatever you need to do, I promise you will live to the next session. Session, Promise. Mm-hmm. Because you can, you don't have to do it every day. And and breaking that cycle, it, and what I've watched is so empowering when they go, oh, like I'm alive still. Like I didn't run for two hours and I'm like, okay. I know, I know, I know you are, but I know you didn't trust that, right? Yeah. So it really is about shifting it from should, shouldn't, and shame to want. I, I go out for runs here and there. There's nothing wrong with it. If my body goes, hey, I got a lot of excess energy today. I want to go for a run. I'll run. But just like Forrest Gump did, one of my favorite movies of all time, <laughs> just as an aside, favorite one of fa- Star Wars, Forrest Gump. I've got a couple of them, but you know where he's running and he's running and then he just stops because he like didn't feel it. Anymore. I think he says, I'm kind of tired. I think I'll go home now yeah, <laughs> after he just he ran like 10,000 miles or something like that. Right. right. And he's got all these followers. Right. <laughs> but like that. So that's what I do now. He's like my model in a way. Like my body feels like I want to run. I go for a run when it's like done. I stop and I walk the rest of the way. Like there isn't a, a should. You know, what's it beautiful about that him. analogy is, uh, or that, that scene is, you know, he's got all these followers who have this deep belief in like what he's doing and it's this underlying meaning and all this stuff. And he's like, I'll go home now. And everybody's like, well, what are we supposed to do now? He's like, well, I was just running. Cause I needed to run. Like right, go, right. go figure out what you're going to do. Right. Like that was it, right. It wasn't, not for you. <laughs> right. it wasn't about anything else, but that. I rewatch that. I know That's it's beautiful. a great, it's a great, it's a great scene. I mean, it's a great movie, but it's a great scene. And it really ignites that kind of place in me, that uh, understanding, like sometimes you just, your body feels like it wants to do something. So do it. 
it's okay. That's not a shameful thing, right? You want to run, go run, but stop when it feels bad. And And if you don't want to, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. And if you don't want to run and you want to go to yoga and that's what would feel good that day to stretch, go to yoga. If you don't want to do anything, don't. You'll I tell people I only go for a run if an animal is chasing me. <laughs> um, I'm not available. <laughs> yeah. Like if it doesn't feel good, yeah. don't do it. Because yeah. what we know happens is weight loss uh, is, is exercise resistance. We know that we've known that that's a term that's been in the, in, in hidden underneath the media for like 25 years. But exercise resistance happens when we push ourselves to do exercise that our body doesn't want to do. And what we know happens is that essentially at some point you turn off, you become resistant to wanting to do exercise because you pushed yourself so hard in an abusive fashion that your whole psyche shuts down. I it think it's, do. I think it's also important to note we're talking about one side of um, the same, same coin, which is people pushing themselves really hard and then feeling like they, at some point they just start to crumple. And then there's yeah. the other side of it, which is the people watching the people pushing themselves so hard and mm-hmm. saying, wow, look at how disciplined you are. And then they say to themselves, oh, I'm not that disciplined. And their self-worth goes down. And then they decide not to do anything because they don't feel worth it. They don't feel that mm-hmm. self-worth. And they're the same. It's all the same thing. I just yeah. want to I just want to highlight that because I just I, some people might not identify with like I'm achieving, I'm disciplined, I'm after it. And then I burn out. It, mm-hmm. it, other people might be like, oh, I want to be that person. I wish I was that person. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important to realize like. The, the truth of this all is just show up for yourself yeah. from a genuine place. Yeah. And um, that's hard to do. I mean, if people want to talk about long-term consistency or I, I hate when people say like, I just, I wish I could be motivated. I'm like, well, your intention, if, if you're saying that, I wish I could be motivated to exercise. That is clear indication to me, <laughs> your connection with movement and your intention for why you're doing it is maybe off base. Mm-hmm. And I think that if we can learn how to connect with ourselves and go from our mind, which is the should, to our body, which tells us how we feel, mm-hmm. and we move in that direction, you never have to worry about meeting, being motivated to exercise ever again because no, yeah. your body will tell you when it wants to and your body will tell you when it doesn't. And it will not be predicated on any outside validation. And so if, if, if we want to crack the code to I want to be motivated and I want to st- stick with a program long term, shift your intention. Shift the way you're thinking about it. Shift the way you believe it. Shift the way you're looking to get validation for it. Mm-hmm. And ask your say, I want to crack the, the door to curiosity. I want to, I don't know how, but I want to learn how to connect with my body. And I want to get out of my mind and out of the shoulds and out of the obsessive nature around it. And I want to learn. Mm-hmm. And that intention alone, I believe, will take you down a path that will, I mean, I, I used to use exercise for punishment. Mm-hmm. I haven't done that in two years. Sometimes I work out one day a week. Sometimes I don't work out at all. Sometimes I work out three days a week. Sometimes I don't work out for two or three weeks. Mm-hmm. I just do what my body says. And guess what? I've never felt better. And I've never had to, since I've done that, I've never had to cultivate motivation. Mm-hmm. Doesn't even exist in my world anymore. All right. But right. there's a period, there's a transition with that because when I first started, oh, I should have done it, but my body says, no, it's so scary. Like you were talking about, I'm, I, I guess I'm just, okay, I, I'm just not, I'm going to rest mm-hmm. and just, just, just trusting that process. Oh, this is my body thinking I'm not safe because I used to exercise all the time and I don't feel like it and it's a new pattern. But if you stick with that intention and crack that door to curiosity, I personally believe you're never going to have to cultivate that motivation ever again. You just listen to your body. Mm-hmm. Does somebody have to motivate you to brush your teeth? Sometimes or, or, <laughs> or take a shower. Yeah. Right. Like just go ahead, go ahead and don't brush your teeth and don't take a shower and then just watch what happens. You'll be like, I want to do this to take care of myself. Right. When, when showing up for your fitness routine or choosing to um, consume foods that you know are going to nourish your body comes from that same place, then I feel like you're, you're kind of pointing the right direction. And when it's coming from this should, like you said, Wendy, thank you. That was a beautiful tool. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like, Pause and examine. Yeah. Pause and examine. What's yeah. the intention there? Yeah. When it's when it's should, shouldn't, or shame, you've always got to stop. Mm. Because that's that's the ticket, so to speak, to recognize that that's other people's stuff. That's other people's beliefs. And you're totally disconnected from what from what you're lined up with, right? From what your mind, body, spirit, soul needs in the moment. I think it's hard to feel comfortable with disappointing others or sticking out from the crowd 
and being true to yourself. And I think people need to realize that really connecting with yourself and being true to yourself means that you're going to disappoint people. You're going to mm-hmm. stick out from the crowd. There's going to be people that are upset. And we already touched on this a little bit. And that's when you find the people who can love and accept you for who you are. Um, and just regardless accept of those transitions, that accept that relationships end, accept that you being you might not make other people feel okay. And that's okay too. Mm-hmm. That's okay too. It's hard so. to do. Well, before we go, Wendy, I want to mention your books. You sent these to me a couple of weeks ago. I really appreciate it. Um, Shattering the Belief Code is one of them. How to change the beliefs which prevent you from discovering, transforming, and igniting your true self. Mm. Uh, th- I'm really excited to dive into this one. And Great then, title. <laughs> um, and then Overcoming Emotional Eating, an experimental workbook. So I'm excited. This is like this is like an actual workbook. Oh wow. Um, I think this will so this could be like really hands on practical, um, you know, sometimes I feel like people need the practical tools that take them to that deeper space. So uh, we'll have, you know, do you, are these on Amazon? Can people just like, yeah, so okay. you can find them on Amazon or you can go to my website, the www.wendyfrancis.com. Um, there's two online courses there. And then I have all my books. I actually have two other books that I didn't oh. have it, in my presence to send to you, but I will. Uh, oh, wonderful. What are the names are, of those books? Uh, it's the 3P Protocol, which talks about the three components that really should be involved. There should, right? But we'll take that out. But <laughs> that, um, that we, we'd want to cor- incorporate if somebody does need to change their body for some reason, that you really want to have the physiology and the psychology combined, mm. um, as well as the physicality, because we forget the psychological component all the time. Yeah. Uh, um, and then inspired eating, which is just a recipe book that kind of combines some really fun recipes for people. So, but those are all on my website that you can find as well as my podcast and my podcast links. So, and then uh, tell us about where people are you on social media? Can people find you on social media? Yeah. So you can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, my Instagram account just got hacked, oh, which no. is lovely. Um, but we're going to get that back up and running um, within the next week. So. Yeah, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. You can find me on there. My website is the best place to to go to for updates of new things, groups I'm running, speaking engagements, et cetera. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Wendy, for joining us today, for the work that you do, and for just providing such amazing amazing insight and and an in-depth conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Makes me feel good to know that you guys are out there. So wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. We'll we'll see you next Thanks, week. Wendy. Thanks everybody. Bye guys. Have a great day.